Welcome to my talk. Uh, my name is Lutz Andershagen. This is a joint work with Petra Mutze and uh, Niels Kriege. Peter and I are from the University of uh, Bonn and Niels is from the University of Vienna. And the title of our uh, paper is Temple Walk Centrality, Ranking Nodes and Evolving Networks. Uh, we propose a temporal walk centrality that quantifies the node importance by uh, the node's ability to obtain and distribute information in a temporal network. And our assumption is that information spreads along temporal walks. And uh, we propose three algorithms, two, two exact algorithms and one approximation algorithm with different running times and properties. Here you see a very tiny example network. This is some email network where Alice sends an email to Bob on Monday and Bob sends an email to Carol on Tuesday. And intuitively, we, we see that Bob is um, in a situation where he can pass on information that he gets from Alice to Carol. And our intuition is that this should be um, given a high value of centrality compared to the other two nodes. And um, the question is, why, why we consider temporal graphs? Now we see the, a similar example. But uh, notice that the, the timestamps are switched. So we have uh, um, that Alice sends an email to Bob on Tuesday, and Bob sends an email to Carol on Monday. And now it's clear that there can no uh, information be passed via Bob from Alice to Carol. However, if we would ignore the temporal information of this network, then we obtain the underlying static graph we see below. And here we could um, have a wrong conclusion that uh, Alice could send some information to Carol because we don't have this restricting information about the time. Okay, to formalize uh, our temporal graph model, uh, we have a temporal graph consisting out of a set of vertices V and a set of temporal edges. And each temporal edge consists out of two nodes and one timestamp, a discrete timestamp. And additionally, we have a global transition time delta. Um, on the right, you'll see an example of a temporal graph. This is our running example. And we can also um, interpret this temporal graph as a sequence of static graphs. So in the temporal graph, at each edge, you see the timestamp. And if we um, interpret it as a sequence of static graphs, for each timestamp, we have um, a static graph with the same vertex set, but only the edges that have the corresponding timestamp. For example, for t equals one, we only have one edge uh, with timestamp one, and t equals two, we have two edges with timestamp two, and so on. Here only the first three time slices are shown. And um, a temporal walk is similar to a static walk, but with the additional restriction that the times have to increase. So um, or not necessarily increase, it depends on the delta value, the global transition time. So we have, uh, for example, this temporal walk from A to C via B, and we arrive at vertex B at one plus delta. And if um, delta is smaller, or one plus delta is smaller than three, we can use the next edge to go to C. So um, depending on the transition time, if it's zero or strictly positive, we distinguish between strict and non-strict temporal walks. So for a non-strict temporal walk, we could uh, also extend this walk uh, with another edge here. So this would be the case of delta zero. Okay. Um, before we can introduce our temporal walk centrality, we first define uh, a weight for walks. And um, we define the weight of a walk as the following product shown here, where phi is a <clears throat> weight function depending on the waiting time uh, at the vertices of the walk. For example, assuming now that delta equals one and um, considering the walk from A to G, the, uh, walk, the weight of the walk would be uh, given by this expression, where we have um, for the uh, waiting function phi as input, the arrival time at the vertex and the time that we leave the vertex. For example, for vertex C, we arrive at uh, time two plus delta, so at two plus one, and we leave the vertex at three. 
And similarly at vertex E, we arrive at three plus one and leave at five. And examples for phi would be, um, we show on the right two examples. One example would be that we set uh, phi to a constant between zero and one, and then we have an exponential decay in the length of the walk. Or if we want to wait the, the waiting time, um, then we could set it to one over one plus uh, T2 minus T1, which intuitively means if we wait a longer time at the vertex, the information is not as fresh anymore and not as valuable. So we don't want to give it a high weight. But if we can pass it on it immediately, then the information, the value is uh, higher. Um, furthermore, let in and out be the sets of uh, all the incoming or, or outgoing walks at the uh, vertex u at time t. Then we define uh, w in and w out as the sum of the weights of the incoming and outgoing walks at vertex u at time t. Um, now we can define the temporal walk centrality at the vertex u um, as a product of w in and w out and uh, additional weighting function phi, where the incoming walks uh, are before the outgoing walks, meaning that t1 is smaller or equal to t2, and t1 and t2 are from the set of all possible arrival and starting times. Okay, here we are back to our uh, running example. Um, let, uh, in this example now, be uh, delta equal one, and we set phi um, for all weight functions to one. This means um, that uh, w in and w out uh, correspond to the actual number of incoming and outgoing walks. Note that um, the temporal walk centrality of A, F, and G is here zero, because the reason is that, for example, for A, there are no incoming edges, and there are no incoming walks, and W in would be zero. And similarly, for G, um, W out is zero. So the walk centrality is zero. For the vertex F, we see that the only incoming edge is at time five, and the only outgoing edge at time two, so that's impossible of a temporal walk here. So we also have a centrality value of zero. Now for vertex B, we have at arrival time two, uh, one walk arriving and one walk leaving at uh, time three. So the temporal walk centrality of vertex B equals one. Now for vertex C, we have one incoming walk and seven outgoing walks. Notice that the uh, edge from B to C would arrive at time four because we have the transition time of one. So this walk is not counted as incoming walk. Um, similarly, for vertex D, we have a, a centrality value of six because we have two incoming walks and three outgoing walks. And finally, for vertex uh, E, we have now uh, two different arriving times, uh, one and uh, no. Uh, arriving time four and five, and two uh, walks arriving at time four and three walks arriving at time five. So in total, we have a centrality value of 10. Um, using these uh, centrality values, we have the following ranking shown here, and we see that vertex E is the most important uh, by our definition of uh, our centrality measure. And this is different from other common state-of-the-art uh, centrality measures. Uh, we see that the temporal between us and also the static between us um, are not capable to represent um, the vertices B and D because they are both not on any uh, shortest path, temporal shortest path, and they are wrongly um, uh, ranked with zero value. Um, similarly, the temporal cut centrality focuses on um, incoming walks. And here we have that, uh, for example, G and F are rated, ranked very high, where for our centrality measure, they are ranked the lowest. And we see a similar problem for temporal closeness that also um, uses the shortest duration of pass. And here we would have 
uh, high value of a vertex A, but in our definition, A is uh, ranked the lowest. And um, similar problem we have for the static random walk between us, which is very similar, but it ignores the temporal properties of the network. And here we have um, also the vertex F ranked differently than in our sensibility measure. We applied this also to a, a real world uh, network. For example, the Enron uh, subgraph. Enron is some email communication network from some company between employees. And here we have an induced subgraph um, of 38 nodes and 541 edges. Um, and the <clears throat> color of the nodes represent the uh, centrality value. The darker the color, the higher is the centrality value. And on the left, we see the ranking uh, with our temporal walk centrality. And in the middle, for the temporal between us, um, we see there is the average relative um, value of the nodes lower compared to um, the temporal walk centrality because it's more strict uh, in only considering path. On the other hand, in the static walk between us, um, the uh, temporal restrictions are ignored, and this leads to average higher, rel relatively higher values um, and different rankings. Okay, now to the computation of the temporal walk centrality, we introduce three different algorithms. The first two um, are based on a transformation of the temporal graph to a static line graph representation. Um, and the third one operates directly on the temporal graph and is a streaming algorithm that uses two passes over the chronologically ordered temporal edges. Um, the idea of the algorithms that use the transformation is to use uh, to transform the graph into a directed acyclic graph and use matrix powers of the adjacency matrix to compute the walks. The first uh, algorithm is based on matrix inversion, and the second one is an approximation that uses power iteration. The common approach of all three algorithms is to first compute W in and W out, and from this we can calculate the temporal walk centrality for each vertex easily. Um, note that for the two, first two algorithms that use uh, the transformation, it's possible to use it for non-strict temporal graphs, so where we have a transition time of zero. And for the streaming algorithm, we have uh, we need the transition time to be strictly positive. Okay, here's a subset of the uh, data set that we used in our evaluation. Uh, we have up to um, 200 million temporal edges, and note that the a transformation into the directed line graph can lead to a quadratic blow up. So in this case, for the largest data set, we have up to 83 billion um, static edges. This table shows the running times in seconds for our uh, algorithms. And we see um, <coughs> that the, the blow up of the transformation into a static graph can lead to out of memory um, because the size increases too much. Um, the uh, exact algorithm that uses the transformation and is based on the matrix inversion can only handle the very small data set because the matrix inversion practically, uh, in practical case, use cubic uh, running time. Where the approximation algorithm is magnitudes uh, uh, orders of magnitudes faster. We show here the results for different um, approximation errors. However, in all cases, so one minute left. Okay, thank you. Uh, in all cases, the streaming algorithm uh, beats the other algorithms and is the fastest. But um, as I mentioned earlier, this is only uh, can only be applied if the transition time is strictly positive. But this is the case, um, in, or we can assume this almost always because usually we can assume that information is not um, passed instantaneously. So even for very large data sets, our algorithm is very scalable. 
So in conclusion, we introduced the temporal walk centrality that cap captures the intuition of important nodes uh, and that are capable of passing on information. And it can be computed very efficiently with high accuracy in case of the approximation. And with our streaming algorithm also, uh, it can be applied to large scale temporal networks. In future, we want to eval evaluate more weighting functions and uh, study the application in controlling and monitoring spreading processes on fake news, uh, for example, of fake news or diseases and temporal networks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lutz. Very nice talk. Question time. Are there any questions? I have one, actually two. Um, the first is your definition of the temporal walk centrality. Is it just the total number of walks going through that vertex uh, weighted by, by their weight? Because when you're doing this product, you are basically multiplying all prefixes by all suffixes with, you know. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. Thank you, Just. Yeah. For, as a double check, uh, my actual, my real question is, um, your algorithms use, uh, uh, are based on truncating a series, right? Uh, what about a completely different approach based on sampling? Um, yeah, I think sampling of um, random walks is, uh, um, I'm not sure how to avoid the bias. I think you could um, use some Monte Carlo approach, but um, I think the streaming algorithm was always faster. So we looked into the approximation, but um, yeah, I think uh, correcting the bias of uh, sampling the random walks um, was not efficient enough, maybe we didn't find the right approach yet. but i think it's definitely worth to investigating sampling approaches um like similar similar to the one we saw earlier uh for the yeah sample between us yeah that's a, a good point yeah this should be it's a uh, something that could be done in future work too yeah thank you thank you